Guitar Hero 1 and 2 were without a doubt fantastic entrance points for the rhythm game genre, especially with how seamless the glow-up from its debut to its sequel was. The jankiness of Guitar Hero 1 with its brutally tight engine and washed-out graphics were instantly changed to provide Guitar Hero 2 the fresh coat of paint it deserved. It is now the summer of 2007, and a great deal of the Guitar Hero 2 expert setlist has been FC'd, leaving only three of its songs left for the most dedicated player base to finish off. During this time frame, however, Harmonix had plans to release a bonus-esque game before its proper third edition came out, and while it had a very central theme aesthetically and sonically, its charts varied so drastically and harshly to where they become infamous for representing some of the hardest charts in the series thus far. Not only has GH2 not been FC'd at this point, but GH1 still had quite a few songs left as well, so it was going to be a bit disorienting at trying to keep up with not only the current FC meta of Guitar Hero, but trying to take down a third game that had a couple songs that almost seemed like they were never gonna budge. This is the score progression of the Guitar Hero Encore Rocks the 80s Expert Setlist. Guitar Hero Encore Rocks the 80s, or GH80s for short, is a bonus 80s themed release Guitar Hero game that solely uses rock and metal tracks from the 1980s, along with other minor aesthetic changes to further represent the era. Unofficially teased only a couple months after GH2 is released, Harmonix would officially confirm this information with some more details in May of 2007, and the game would be released to the public in North America on July 24th of that year. The game is 30 tracks, 6 tiers, and no bonus songs to accompany it. The soundtrack was considered to be pretty solid overall by critics, but the $50 price tag was a major issue that just about everyone took with it, along with the fact that the game used the exact same engine as Guitar Hero 2's. It's essentially a reskin GH2 with a themed soundtrack, and many have speculated this to be Harmonix's first attempt at a cash-grab Guitar Hero game to capitalize off the sheer momentum and hype off of the franchise. Not all too surprisingly, a lot of the songs in the game were trivial and difficulty when met with the game best players, especially with songs like Institutionalize and Hangar 18 that were FC'd on GH2. And with only 30 songs, about 80% of GH80s was pretty much rolled out entirely and FC'd by the community on command. The first major FC of the game would occur on the day of the game's release by I'm Chris for Life, FC'ing Play With Me, the last song in the career setlist. Cotton and Mosh and 17 sought FC's the very next day by Smokey Prog and AS942 respectively. Cotton and Mosh shares a great deal of chord dexterity and some brief fast soloing, while 17 has two 30 second note solo sections that require a bit of strumming precision and zig proficiency. Lastly, to wrap up July, Round and Round would be FC'd by FAC, a chart that has three notably difficult solo sections. The first showcasing some zigs and zig quad variations, the second having tons of varying note separations and strums interlaced, and the last solo throwing in a bunch of zigs and descending quads to wrap up a rather hectic Tier 4 Encore song. With August underway and the game being out for exactly a week, the game had already been down to three songs on FC'd, because it's Midnight, Ballroom Blitz, and Electric Eye. All songs were in separate tiers as well, which are 2, 4, and 6. Naturally, one would assume the Tier 6 song would be the hardest, but oddly enough, it was closer than ever to being FC'd, as ES942 had FC'd a majority of the solo and obtained a 98% on July 29th, 2007. He claimed to have hit solos A through D, but struggled to hit solo E. All of the solos in this chart span only a few seconds long and are primarily focused on relatively common solo patterns. But solo E was different, as it introduced what are called chimneys, a pattern that requires a tapping and a zig input, the left hand doing the zig input, and the right hand doing the basic tapping. Then you have some castles on the red fret that transition into some descending sweeps, and solo F more or less lets you cruise in as a sort of victory lap. Hell Ashes had also documented multiple 99%s around this time too, with three separate 99% runs all missing in various places. But another player decided to create their own dedicated accomplishments thread on Score Hero, and he would kick it off with an instant bang by FCing Electric Eye on August 4th, 2007. Now at this point, there are only two songs left, and given how fast the community had FC'd everything thus far, even charts that incorporated fairly underused mechanics, how much more difficult could things really get from here? This is Because It's Midnight, a Tier 2 Encore song. 
Since this song is accessible so early on in the career mode of the game, players were met with the fastest tapping chart by far in the entire Guitar Hero series. The only way to even get through this chart for almost every player was to save up all of your star power, activate at the beginning of the solo, and guess like hell all the way through. Let's try and break this all down because there's obviously a lot going on here. The solo begins with a fast green-yellow trill into descending trips that cover all of the frets. Then a longer yellow-blue trill rushes in that transitions into some offbeat notes that go right into descending sweeps. Then into a long zig on the last three notes, a couple sixteenth notes to give you some breathing room, some descending quads to force you right back in, and just when you thought that was enough, the final trill has a blue strum right beforehand that you need to hit first before you even think about bringing your right hand over to tap it. But that's really all there is to it. In all seriousness, this solo is far and beyond the fastest section in the entire game and requires so many different techniques to hit, some of which hadn't been thoroughly explored or performed enough due to the lack of charts previous games offered. Comparably, Jordan from GH2 is the only other tapping-oriented song that could even rival it, and even then it excludes a lot of patterns that are used here. Not to mention again, tapping was still a relatively unexplored concept since Microgamer 2v2's revolutionary Jordan score came out in May of 2007, so this was going to be a new learning experience for just about every top player. There were two players who were immediately after the song upon the game's release, At Remains and Kev227. At Remains had reported a 75% on the solo, while Kev responded with an 87%, but stated such trouble with Solo D that he didn't think an FC could happen for him anytime soon. This left At Remains to take care of the dirty work, and he was more than determined to do so. Solo progress updates were quite common from him, as nearly every day he had something to share, whether it was him sharing techniques to hit certain sections of the solo, or lowering the note count for the entire thing, At Remains would get the note count down to the single digits, missing 8 notes in the solo, on August 3rd, 2007. Not only that, but he had even built up enough confidence to call a shot by declaring August 24th as his goal date to FC the entire song. A few days later, he uploaded a few videos that sadly do not exist anymore, but according to someone in the thread and judging by the context, At Remains had gotten a minus 6 in a full run. He was practicing 6 hours a day to lower the note count just by a couple notes at a time, but if his word holds true, and his progress stays the same, he could very well hit his due date. Despite his overwhelming commitment, he still chalked the potential solo FC down to a lucky run, but shortly after he had made this post, Luck had suddenly made its way to the Score Hero forums a lot quicker than he and anyone else might have expected. Song Darren is awesome. Gas yeah, suit, look at that. Woo All right. On August 15th, 2007, At Remains became the first player to FC the entire solo to Because It's Midnight, blasting through the trips and quads, the zig transitions, and the elusive solo D-trill, the song was now officially, by all technical means, possible to full combo. He would step away from the game for a bit since he was out of the area, but once he arrived back home, the grind continued as if he never left. On August 22nd, 2007, he had posted a 190k score, choking in Solo D where he'd likely miss on the trail. A week later, Kev227 would make a surprise reappearance to nab a 181k score with a 96%. At Remains responds back quickly with a minus 6, but this time missing in solo C and hitting solo D. The FC was inevitable at this point, but hold on, what is this score? In the midst of the score rivalry, a player by the name of James Light Coulter had posted the closest run of Because It's Midnight by far, missing the second to last orange note in the solo D trill. 
James had been around on Score Hero before, but primarily posted the majority of his accomplishments to YouTube only, so this was a massive surprise to put it lightly. The tension between the trio was palpable, and given how spurred the moment these improvements kept popping up, it was looking like a dice roll on who would be the one to close the curtains. But on September 3rd, 2007, just mere days after James's score, no more speculation was necessary. Kev227 had dethroned the beast that was because it's midnight. The innovation, and great required to FC a song of this caliber, in an era where tapping was nowhere near as nuanced, was an astonishing FC for Kev to undoubtedly settle himself into the overall 5 Fred history books. Now there was one and only chart left. And it's unfortunately not as exciting to talk about from a charting standpoint, but the race to complete the game certainly stayed on a lot of players' radars, and they wanted to take a crack at potentially the most infamous Guitar Hero chart ever, Ballroom Blitz. Ballroom Blitz, a song that lies just a little over halfway through the career setlist, and isn't an encore song either. It's placed in a pocket of the game where you'd expect the song to be moderately difficult, and you would be right, as the song sprinkles in a few trills to make sure you're not dozing off, because a lot of the first half can drag on a bit with its abundance of sustain notes, and breaks that can leave players a bit impatient if they want to get to the solo. But be careful what you wish for, because that very solo might be charted into something like this. This is Solo 1B. Solo 1A may seem a tad difficult, but when you feast your eyes on what immediately hits you afterwards, you're met with nothing but absurdity and nearly 20 notes per second strumming. While players didn't know the exact number at the time, this was way above the strumming threshold that the game could withstand, but thankfully there is a solution, as you don't need to technically strum everything. In between all of the frets are hammer-on notes, so you can have your strumming speed by strumming all of the notes that require it and hitting the hammer-ons as they're intended to be hit. What makes this obviously very deceiving is not only the pinpoint timing you need in the first place, but the fact that you have to more or less desync your hands into strumming just the slightest bit after you fret the hammer-ons, since your hands are alternating inputs between every note. Or you can just strum wildly and try to hit as many notes as you can, which is what players most likely did at first, but it's incredibly inconsistent and overall not a reliable strategy for FCing. Players, understandably, were not generally happy with the existence of this chart. The cover was mediocre at best, the hardest part was two and a half minutes in, and that specific part was only three seconds. So in the competitive context of the game, you were basically playing a three second song that had a 150 second buildup. A few players had 98% runs on the song in late 2007, but a lot of players dismissed this chart as almost impossible or so unnecessarily difficult to FC that it wasn't worth sinking time into unless they just randomly got it. With the release of Guitar Hero 3 in late October 2007, the song entered a dry season where virtually no substantial progress was made, and the attention was diverted into charts that had a bit more competitive spirit pushing them. 2008 displayed a glimmer of hope for the song, but mainly within the solo alone, as on January 23rd and January 24th, 2008, two players had gotten a minus one on solo 1B, Steffet and Longsock Silver. Neither video of these exists, unfortunately, but witnesses showed their excitement during Steffet's stream, and others could confirm Longsock Silver's YouTube video too. These accomplishments, though, were met with just about no genuine follow-ups or full attempts at the song aside from a 99% by Steffet, but that wouldn't even occur until March 8th, 2008. GH80s was thought to have been FC'd in its entirety rather quickly after Because It's Midnight was FC'd, but the reality is that Ballroom Blitz was going to require a player that was almost another tier above everyone else. And this player's name was Strike Bowler 585 
Strike Bowler 585 had been exploding in the Guitar Hero scene in the last couple months, primarily with Guitar Hero 1, as he had obtained first ever's on Get Ready to Rock and Triple A, and had his sights on taking the last song in that game as well, Bark at the Moon. For those who aren't too familiar with GH1, it's a game where the hammer-ons and pull-offs are so precise to execute that it's more productive in almost every scenario to simply strum all of the notes. With a player who essentially specializes in strumming precision, Ballroom Blitz was looking to be a solid target Strike Bowler would end up wanting, since it was another game that had one song left to FC. The day after Steffet's 99% run, Strike Bowler posted a minus one on Solo 1B, now becoming the fourth person to be in just one note shy of the FC. All of the other players that had minus ones on it in the past had practically abandoned the song entirely, so GH80's enthusiasts were hoping that wouldn't be the case again. And a few weeks later, livestream viewers of Strike had reported the first documented Solo 1B FC. He even went as far as to provide a method of hitting the solo while FCing it a couple more times, and just a day later, had secured a minus one on not just the solo, but the entire chart. Strike was on the cusp of finishing off two games at once, and the Score Hero community was on the edge of their seats, tuning into every stream, and pressing F5 on Strike's accomplishments thread. The thread would lie suddenly dormant for about a week, but would suddenly be revitalized by GH3-related accomplishments, and then a GH1 FC. After this, there was a much more compelling argument to go for Bark at the Moon or Ballroom Blitz. The former choice would result in a rather abrupt conclusion, but nonetheless a fantastic one, as the next day on April 23rd, 2008, Strike had FC'd Bark at the Moon for the full game community GH1 FC. After the community exploded with excitement and celebration, he still had his sights on Ballroom Blitz, but still had unfinished business in GH1, as he had still not FC'd the game by himself yet. It wasn't until May 13, 2008 that he would now claim to begin attempts at FCing GH80s, except he got distracted yet again. Strike Bowler was prioritizing Thrasher from Rock Band 1 as his next FC, but then this turned into a GH2-oriented grind. GH80s fans were being teased beyond belief, so the song could realistically go another few months without an FC. After a few days of no activity, Strike's accomplishments thread had been updated by a viewer stating a choke on Ballroom Blitz, and before anyone could even get a word in, the community had flooded the thread with a final update that would grace everyone, and especially Strike, with a final sense of clarity. Strike Bowler 585 had FC Ballroom Blitz and finished off GH80s by himself that same stream on May 31st, 2008. A game that was intended to be a simple extension to keep fans entertained until GH3 would end up being the most annoying thorn in the side of players that spend hours upon hours FCing just a select number of songs, some of which unfortunately failed no matter their efforts, and others that succeeded through their intuition and fundamentals that carried over from other games. This full game FC grind was in this awkward limbo where most top players wanted to focus their efforts on the current zeitgeist of GH1 and GH2 on FC songs, but a select few just couldn't keep their hands away and wanted to simply rip the band-aid off while they had the potential to. The story of GH80s isn't incredibly deep, nor is there much video documentation of it at all, but during its time, Score Hero lurkers and posters would watch streams and refresh threads day and night to see if any of these FCs would come into fruition, and the fact that all of the screenshots are still well available and intact is more than enough to reflect on the bittersweet title that was GH80s. Now that we've went over what's basically the side episode of the Guitar Hero series, I hope you're all properly prepared for what's in store next, because almost nothing is going to prepare most of you for what is no doubt the most inspirational and intense Guitar Hero game ever released. But for now, this has been the score progression of the Guitar Hero Encore Rocks D80's Expert Setlist, and thanks for watching. Thank you to all of my patrons for supporting the channel, and if you want to support the channel for more documentaries like this, come be a patron of the channel, and hey, drop a sub if you're new here too. I'll see you on whatever video I upload next, and take care. Thank you.